Boo! Boo! I'm a ghost. Ooh! I can float through the air. I can fly through a wall just to give you a scare. Ooh! Ooh. Boo! I'm a ghost. Full of tricks and surprises. Ooh. I can make myself into all shapes and sizes. Boo! I'm a ghost on Halloween night. If I'm too scary, turn on the light. The Castle Ghost, an adventure in Great Britain. Here we are, Donald. This is Sir Reginald's family castle, Mickey said happily. Mickey was looking forward to seeing his good friend Sir Reginald again. Donald looked around. He had been glad when Mickey invited him to go to Great Britain. Donald had never been there before. Is this it? asked Donald. I thought you said this was an island, Mickey. Where are the palm trees? Where's the pool? Oh, Donald, Great Britain is an island, but it's not a tropical island, Mickey said with a laugh. Well, this vacation isn't what I thought it was going to be, said Donald as he stomped up the steps. The big wooden door swung open, and there was Mickey's pal, Reginald. Jolly good to see you, old chap, said Reginald. So glad you could bring your friend along. Donald and Mickey followed as Reginald led them into the castle. Let's pop into the library, he said. We'll have a spot of tea and get to know each other better. Reginald asked Mickey all about his life in the United States, and Mickey asked Reginald what it was like to live in a British castle. But as they talked, Reginald noticed that Donald was looking grumpy. What's troubling you, old chap? he asked. This isn't exactly the island vacation I had in mind, said Donald. I wanted to go surfing and diving and swimming and water skiing and get a suntan. But I dare say we do have some interesting things to do, said Reginald. What could be interesting as surfing and diving and water skiing, Donald grumbled to Mickey as Reginald took them on the grand tour of the castle. Well, I say, what about having a look at the Tower of London? And there's also Buckingham Palace, Reginald started to say. Oh, said Donald, yawning from boredom. But Reginald misunderstood. I'm so sorry, chaps, he said. I've been chatting away, and you two have had a very long trip. You're probably both very tired. I'll show you to your room. Maybe you'll feel differently after a good night's sleep, Donald. In fact, Donald and Mickey were pretty tired from their trip. It was getting dark. Mickey and Donald unpacked their things and got ready for bed. As soon as their heads hit their pillows, both of them were fast asleep. It was still dark when they heard a loud crash in their room. Mickey and Donald sat bolt upright in bed, staring. There, standing in the room with them, was a ghost. Dressed in an old suit of armor, it was weaving back and forth and carrying a flickering candle. I am the ghost of the Griasser Chauncey, it said in a quivering voice. And you are sleeping in my room. Oh no, 
gasped Donald. It's a real-life ghost. If you wish to sleep in this room, the ghost went on, there is something you must do for me. <gasps> said Don Donald nervously. Anything you say, sir. You must go on a quest, said the ghost. A quest? asked Mickey. What is a quest? What? screeched the ghost. You don't know what a quest is? That's ridiculous. Just tell us, sir, gasped Donald. We'll go on anything you want. Is a quest like a ride? No, 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 said the ghost. It's a search. You must go into London and bring back everything I tell you I want. No problem, Donald said anxiously. Where do we have to go? Oh, all over London, said the ghost. And you must bring back a souvenir from each of these places. There are eight of them. I have a list here, all typed up. I typed the list myself, you know, on my good friend William Shakespeare typewriter. Who's William Shakespeare? Donald asked nervously looking around for another ghost. Why, Shakespeare's one of the most famous storytellers in the history of Great Britain, the ghost thundered. But, Mickey began, looking puzzled and thoughtful at the same time. Silence, the ghost declared. Remember, I'll be back tomorrow night to collect my souvenirs. Then a gust of wind blew out the candle, and Donald and Mickey were left alone in the dark. The next morning at breakfast, they told Sir Reginald all about the ghost in the night. Very odd, said Reginald. I don't recall that we had a ghost in the castle. But anything is possible, I suppose. We have to leave immediately, said Donald, looking worried. We have to collect things from eight different places on this quest. Would you like to come along? asked Mickey as they rose to go. Love to, said Reginald, but I'm afraid I can't make it. Too much work, you know. Okay, said Mickey, as they boarded a double-decker bus in London. Our first stop is Trafalgar Square. What are we supposed to get there? asked Donald. A pigeon feather, said Mickey, squinting at the list. A pigeon feather? asked Donald, looking very upset. We'll never be able to find a pigeon feather. But as luck would have it, there were so many pigeons in Trafalgar Square, it was very easy thing to find. As soon as they'd carefully put the feather away, Donald and Mickey walked toward the Thames River. What's next, Mickey? Donald asked. Next, we visit Westminster Abbey and Big Ben. Who's Big Ben? Donald wanted to know. Big Ben is not a who, said Mickey. It's a what. Big Ben is the most famous bell in the world. It makes the chimes for the clock tower in the parliament. Oh, said Donald respectfully, as he paid for their postcards. Then they headed for Westminster Abbey. Do you have everything we were supposed to get for the ghost? asked Mickey as they stood in line to get inside Madame Tussauds' wax museum. Right here, said Donald. All the ticket stubs and tons of postcards. Once inside the museum, Donald and Mickey were amazed. There were wax statues of some of the most famous people in the world. After the wax museum, it was time to take the boat tour along the Thames River, which wound all through London. The ride took them under all the bridges, including the Tower Bridge. Save that ticket stop, Mickey said. Got it, said Donald. 
Now what? Now we head for the Tower of London, Mickey answered. Oh, Mickey, I'm starving, said Donald. Couldn't we stop and get something to eat? Well, it just so happens that food is on our list, said Mickey. See, right here. It says tea near the tower. Bring back tea sandwiches and biscuits. But first, Mickey and Donald looked at the crown jewels, the dungeons and the armories. Now for food, exclaimed Donald. They ordered an extra serving so they'd have some to bring home to the ghost. But the tea and biscuits were so good, Donald wanted the biscuits on the ghost plate too. Oh no, said Mickey, we're taking these home. Ridiculous, said Donald. What does a ghost need with tea and biscuits anyway? Ghosts don't eat. That is true, Mickey said thoughtfully. But we ought to bring them back anyway, I guess. Mickey and Donald took the underground train to Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace is where the Queen of England and her family live. And Donald stood outside of the gate, hoping to catch a glimpse of them. I've never seen a royal family before, he said. Do you think they might just walk by for a second? I'm sure they would if they knew you were here, said Mickey, laughing. What do we have to bring back for the ghost? A picture of a palace guard, read Mickey. Well, said Donald, here come the guards. I'll see if I can get one of them to smile for the picture. Say cheese, called Donald, as he quickly ran up to one of the guards and started to tell a joke and do a silly dance. He never did get the guard to smile, but Mickey got a great picture anyway. Boy, I'm tired, said Donald, when they got back to Reginald's castle. Me too, said Mickey. Did you have a good time? asked Reginald, following them into the library. As a matter of fact, I did, said Donald. That ghost made us go all over, but I'm glad we did. London is a pretty exciting place. Yes, it certainly is, said Reginald. Funny thing, that ghost. Who did he say he was again? Donald shivered. He said he was Sir Chauncey, and we were sleeping in his room. Never heard of him, said Reginald. But dare I say, you must be tired of being up all night with a ghost, and then sightseeing all day. We'll have an early dinner. As soon as the meal was over, Mickey and Donald went up to their room. But they didn't go to sleep right away. We have to wait up for the ghost, said Donald. We'll give him his stuff, and then we'll get a good night's sleep. But they fell asleep in their chairs, waiting. Just before dawn, a great crash made them leap right off their chairs. It was the ghost. Here are your souvenirs, Donald said when he'd caught his breath. We got everything on the list. So now you can stop haunting us. The ghost started to shake and quiver. And then he pulled the helmet off his head. It's me, Reginald, he said giggling. Donald was stunned, but Mickey started to laugh too. What kind of joke is this, Donald sputtered. Chuckingly, chucking. Merrily, Reginald explained, Best fun I've had in a long time. You see, I knew you could have a good time in London, even though there isn't any water skiing or diving or palm trees. Well, as a matter of fact, I did, Donald admitted. Then he looked at Mickey. But how come you didn't seem surprised, Mickey? 
Mickey chuckled again. Because I figured it out. How? Donald and Reginald asked together. Easy, said Mickey. When the ghost said he used Shakespeare's typewriter, I knew something was up. Typewriters hadn't been invented when Shakespeare wrote all his stories. Oops, said Reginald. I guess I messed up. Not at all, Mickey began. We learned a lot about London. And we also learned that sometimes vacations were even better than we planned. Not only that, I have all these great souvenirs to show everyone when I get home. Donald told him happily. Boo-hoo's on first. It was a sunny spring day. Casper, the friend ghost, left the gloomy old house where he lived. He looked around for someone to play with. Gee, I wish I could find a friend, he said with a sigh as he flew above the town. Casper soon came to a school where two crossing guards were waiting to help the children cross the street. This looks like a good place to find a friend, said Casper as he flew closer. Casper landed right in front of the guards, wearing his friendliest smile. Hi, he said brightly. Yikes, yelled one guard. Help, a ghost, yelled the other. And they both dashed away down the street. Hey, wait a second, Casper called after them. But the guards were already far away. Gee, said Casper, I only wanted to be friends. Just then, Casper heard the school bell ringing. It was time for the children to be dismissed. Gosh, the children are going to need help crossing the street, said Casper. He was worried. Then he had an idea. I guess I'll be their crossing guard today. Casper quickly put on one of the crossing guard's uniforms. The children came to the crosswalk. They were so busy talking that they didn't notice Casper. They all belonged to a baseball team called the Rockets. They were on their way to a big game. Hurry up, you guys, said a big boy carrying a baseball bat. Let's get over to the park. Yes, let's get there before the Tigers so we can practice, said a girl on the team. She was tossing a ball into the air. Whoops, the girl cried as she dropped her ball. The ball bounced away from her and right through Casper. Don't worry, I'll get your ball, Casper told the girl with a smile. He quickly flew after the softball. Casper brought the ball back and held it out to the girl. Help, a ghost, the kids screamed. They ran away as fast as they could, heading toward the park. Gee, I can't find anyone to play with today, Casper said sadly. I guess I'll just go home. Casper was about to fly away when he saw one more little girl. She was all alone and looked unhappy. What's wrong? Casper asked her. Oh my, the girl gasped when she looked up and saw Casper. You look like a ghost. I'm a friendly ghost, Casper explained. My name is Casper. What's your name? The little girl was scared, but she didn't run away. My name is Jill, she said finally. Would you like to play ball with me, Jill, said Casper. Jill was quiet for a minute. Casper thought she might dash off, leaving him all alone again. Then Jill smiled at Casper. Okay, Casper, she said. Those other kids won't let me play with them. 
They say I'm too little, but I'll play with you. Great, said Casper happily. Jill took his hand and the two new friends walked over to the park. Casper and Jill found a good place to play. Hey, that was a great catch, said Casper when Jill caught a high fly ball. Your turn to bat now. Sure, said Jill as they switched places. This is fun. Batter up, Casper called out as he pitched the ball to Jill. She swung hard and hit the ball. They both watched as the ball flew over a row of tall bushes. Great hit, said Casper. Casper was about to fly after the ball. Then he said, You'd better go get the ball, Jill. I don't want to scare anyone else today. Jill ran after the ball and found the rest of the kids from school on the other side of the bushes. Her ball had landed right in the middle of the big game. You hit that ball way over here? One boy asked her. Jill just nodded. Hey, want to play on our team? Asked the girl on the rocket. Sure, said Jill. Then she remembered Casper. I'll be right back, she told them. Jill ran to the other side of the bushes and told Casper what happened. Come on, Casper, said Jill. Let's play with the other kids. But I'll scare them all away, said Casper. I always do. Then Jill had an idea. Can you make yourself invisible? How's this, said Casper with a laugh. He had disappeared completely. Perfect, said Jill. Jill stood in the outfield, ready to catch any balls that came in her direction. Casper was there too, but nobody knew that except Jill. Casper, are you there? she whispered. I'm a little scared. Don't worry, I'll help you, Casper whispered back. Then he tucked playfully on her ponytail and made Jill giggle. Finally, it was the last inning. The Rockets were ahead by just one run. The next batter was the biggest boy on the other team, and the bases were loaded. Uh-oh, said Jill, I bet this guy will hit the ball. But if we get him out, the Rockets win the game, said Casper. I hope so, Jill said nervously. Strike one, called the catcher as the big boy swung and missed. The pitcher for the Rockets threw the next ball. Strike two, called the catcher. One more strike and the game was over. The pitcher threw the ball and the boy swung. It was a hit. The ball soared into the blue sky. Oh no, cried Jill. It was going way over her head. Jill ran back as fast as she could. You can do it, Jill, called Casper. But he could see that she wasn't going to reach the ball in time. Casper flew up, caught the ball and dropped it right into Jill's glove. Hooray, shouted the Rockets. We won! We won! And all because of you, Jill, said one of the boys. But it wasn't just me. My friend Casper helped too. Jill looked around, but Casper was still invisible. Casper, where are you? Suddenly, all the kids could see Casper, but this time they didn't run away. Hooray for Jill and Casper, they cheered. Come and play with us tomorrow, said a girl on the team. You're great. Jill smiled at Casper, and he smiled back. They both knew they didn't have to worry anymore about making friends. They were rockets now.